All righty, well, welcome back from lunch. Hopefully you are recharged and you got some uh, talking so that you don't have to go from sitting to sitting to sitting quietly. So let me just say right off the bat, if you have questions, I welcome them. So I um, was given a topic, and it was in the lines of taking care of yourself personally. And I, I really want to make things practical, but I also wanted to have this kind of scriptural basis. So we'll s start in scripture, but then I, I really want to make this practical for you. So I want to leave time for questions, and if at any point you have a question, just wave at me. So we good with that? So we'll get going here. So... Um, I love that my Facebook feed, I don't know if you guys love this, but I love that it has the memories that pop up. And so all this week, in fact, the past couple of weeks, it's been memories of remodeling. And so I'm not a remodel, I'm not a contractor, but I'm one of those people that anything I put my mind to, I actually can accomplish, but I shouldn't remodel. <laughs> so I could give you lots of examples of that, but in the history of Canyon Creek Church, we have actually remodeled quite a few times. And if you've been a part of a church for any length of time, you probably have experience remodeling as well. And so, you know, over the years, it's been everything from changing paint color, I've done a lot of painting over the years, to, um, you know, changing flooring and color schemes and art and all those kinds of things. But most recently, which was two years ago this fall, we took on a major remodel project. So there's a whole big backstory to it, but what you need to know is there came a point at Canyon Creek where we were multi-campus, multi-site, we still are, and my husband was leading one campus and I was leading another, which I do not... <laughs> I do not prescribe to be a good plan, but that's just how it was at the time. In fact, Rachel over here uh, was the kids pastor on my team. And so uh, we were in a school, and anybody that's done portable church, or if you're doing portable church, you just long for your own building. And so we longed for our own building, and we got a building. And that building uh, is, we are in that building now. It is a geodesic dome. It was bought at a trade show in a kit, delivered to a site in Mill Creek, Washington. If you live in Western Washington, you know that it rains here. They dug a hole because there were limits for the height of the building in Mill Creek, so they dug a hole. They did not put a foundation on it, and they built a wood geodesic dome on the dirt in a hole. <laughs> So there are many issues with this building is the point of that. And we needed to remodel it, and we were doing major renovation. And so this major renovation was including things like tearing down walls and, you know, everything from tearing holes in the floor in the bathroom and adding extra toilets to opening up spaces to closing up space. I mean, it was major work. And we did this ourselves, our, the, the team and our volunteers. And here's what I would say... Um, about remodel, and what I'm grateful for is I learned some really good life lessons in this period of time. One of them being I shouldn't remodel, and I don't really ever want to do it again. But also, um, I learned some things about having to be flexible, because our very ambitious two-and-a-half-month timeline to remodel that building was not doable, and I really like to achieve things and accomplish my goal, so I had to get over feeling like I completely failed, and because it took us an extra month, we didn't actually have anywhere to go for a month because we, did, we had lost our school and, and just problem solving, problem solving, problem solving, all at Christmas time, which is extra awesome. And so um, I had to learn a lot of things, and I learned a lot of things about what you can and can't do inside of a building when you're doing demo work. So remodeling, uh, raise your hand if you've done any remodel work. <laughs> oh my gosh. These are the right people, because you're all going to nod your heads and go, yep. Remodeling is excruciating work. It is incredibly time-consuming. It was like 14-hour days to begin with, and towards the end, towards our deadline, we just, my team would take turns going home to take a nap or going downstairs into a classroom to just take a nap, because you just, you got to get the work done. So remodeling is it always costs more than you think it's going to cost. It always takes longer than you think it's going to take. It's always, there are always problems that come up, like 
when you just replaced all of the flooring in the basement and then you come in and there's two inches of water down there because they built the building in a hole in the dirt. I mean, just it just goes on and on and on. And I wouldn't change it for anything because what I gained from it besides life lessons was also I'm so proud of what we accomplished and the bonding that happened between all of us doing the remodel work was something I wouldn't exchange for anything. I'm not gonna lie, I probably wouldn't volunteer to do a remodel project right now, but I wouldn't trade that we did it. And on our grand opening some, uh, Sunday, the little campus I was leading that had had an average attendance of 300 had 650 people walk through the door the first Sunday that we were open. And myself and my staff and some of our volunteers, we, we stood there just sobbing as people walked in. Which just imagine if you're a guest at a church and you're walking in like, I'm so glad to see you. I mean, it was, you know, we were just over the top, so tired. But the bond between us and the results of what we saw were so worth the effort. And so I thought that I would share with you this afternoon um, about a topic I'll call load-bearing walls. And I think you guys might have some pictures of remodel. You can just flip through those. There's probably like seven or eight. Um, this is some of the major renovation we had to do in demoing. And so I tried to do a before and after of some of our main spaces. And I mean, we did some major work in this place. And these pictures make it look really awesome, the afters. It's still an old building that's in a hole in the dirt <laughs> in, in Mill Creek. And it's scheduled to be torn down within the next couple of years because it's just not sufficient for our needs. But we're really proud of what we did in that building. So I'm going to give you what I think um, is a life lesson on load-bearing walls. So a load-bearing wall is a wall that bears the weight of the house above the said wall, resting upon it by conducting its weight to a foundational structure. The materials used in load-bearing walls are usually of very sound quality. As If you've done remodel, you know this, but as you could guess, so concrete or block or brick or very, very solid beams. Uh, during our remodel, we were going to take down um, a couple of walls, and we were in our basement. And uh, they had added on to the building, so there's like really awkward doorways with old exterior doors leading into random rooms that made no sense. So we were just gonna take down some walls, no big deal. Until someone tells you, as you're holding the sledgehammer, ready to start sledging down the wall, hey, if you take down that wall, the whole building's coming down because that is a load-bearing wall. And that just really has stuck with me. Um, as a visual for how important it is for us as Christians and us as leaders to have very sound walls, load-bearing walls, things that are non-negotiable, non practicing in our life, because if those come down, the whole thing can come down on top of it. Okay, you with me so far? So let's look at um, Scripture. So if you'll turn to Luke chapter 10, I'll read uh, a very familiar verse. I'll give you the setting of it first. And that is, uh, in Luke chapter 10, we have um, a man coming to Jesus. Scripture says he's an expert in the religious law. This is verse 25. And he comes up and he, he says to Jesus, uh, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? What do you take this to mean? And this man would know the law of me Moses because he was an expert in the religious law. So he would have quoted the law of Moses. He would have quoted certain aspects of the law at the beginning and ending of each day. They would have been rote memorization ingrained in him from childhood. And so he replies, well, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And, of course, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the love your neighbor as yourself part. But Jesus replies with, right, do this and you will live. And I love that distinction because there's the distinction from knowing the right answer and being able to recite it and actually put it into practice. Also, when Jesus says, do this and you will live, he did not mean if you don't do this, you will immediately drop dead on the ground. What, he, what the actual translation of do this and you will live, that live means that you will have abundant life, that you will truly experience real life. And so Jesus was trying to point out to this guy, it's one thing to know 
the right answer. It's another thing to actually do it. And so from that verse, so I'll read it again from verse 27. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. From that verse that we all probably know and can recite, I'm going to give us four main categories or load-bearing walls in your life. So first of all, the first wall would be your heart. Okay, that's the first one mentioned there in Scripture. That heart, the word heart comes from the Greek word cardia. And this is what it literally means. Soul or mind as the fountain or seat of all thoughts, all passions, all desires, all appetites, all affections, all purposes, and all endeavors. This is the seat of everything you long for, desire for, feel love for, are passionate about. It's all seated here in the heart. It also includes your will and your character. So when we love God with all of our heart, it's going to require all of us. It's not a category of our life. And I know you all agree with this. But I'm just putting it all on the same page for us today. All of your passion, all of your desires, all of your appetites, everything that gets you jazzed up, everything you long for, all that you love in this world, whether it's a thing or it's a person or it's a place, all of it fits in this category of first we love God with everything that we have. Um, I think we're really good at following the rules, and I think uh, the Pharisees were really good at following the rules. And as much as we like to pick on the Pharisees, we, we tend to follow them, I think, more than we're willing to admit. And so we're good at saying, well, I do these things and I don't do these things. Well, I abstain from this. And, and we put ourselves in this category of being able to tick off the to-do list or the checklist, but really that makes us religious. In fact, the religious... Uh, zealots or the teachers of the law were known, I don't know if you know this, uh, were known for being so letter of the law that when it came to tithing, they could be found counting the leaves of the herbs in their yards, one for the Lord, two, three, four, you know, for me, one for the Lord, loud enough, of course, so other people could hear it. And this comes from the writings of Josephus, but still, they were extremely letter of the law. And that's, of course, not what I'm insinuating here. I'm talking about the love you have for God, which should be first. It is your first load-bearing wall, that desire to know the Lord, to love him at a deep level. I referred to earlier this morning, Philippians, where Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. And, and I, if I could emphasize this more than maybe just reading it out of your Bible, I mean, Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him in an intimate, deep, loving, longing, love kind of a way. And we end up with this sort of loveless relationship with God sometimes. And if you're in this room and you're married or you even have a deep friendship or relationship with somebody or maybe you're really close to one of your parents or a sibling, then you understand that just an acknowledgement of their position in your life is not significant. It requires a love, which is much deeper than an acknowledgement that comes with it. You with me so far? Um, I, wanna, I wanna make these practical too. So before I move past this wall, um, I just, there's something about worship in your life as a practical way of showing love for God that really can't be replaced by anything else. And I realize I'm talking to a room full of people that most of your worship is probably characterized by children's songs. <laughs> and you don't always get to make it into a service where there's worship, but you can worship. And worship is not just singing, and it's not just singing the words for, to songs. Worship is this relationship of love and adoration for Jesus Christ that should be part of your everyday life. And I'm not saying that in a scolding way. I'm saying that in an encouraging way. It could be as simple as putting on worship music so that you feel inspired to just talk to the Lord. It could be just opening your mouth and saying, 
God, I, I declare you in my life as big and full of grace, and you are my guide, and you are my strength. I mean, just declaring the attributes of God is worship. So worship is bigger than just the music category or the singing category or the raise your hands or the bow your head. Worship is an expression of your love to Christ, and that's a very practical way for you to practice this heart, the load-bearing wall of heart. Okay? Moving on to number two. The second wall would be soul. So the religious man replies, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. Okay, so what is the soul? That word comes from the Greek word psyche, and it literally means breath of life. There's, there's a, a word picture that comes with it of this vital force that animates you. So without preaching an entire sermon on this, because I get really jazzed up on this one. So I'm sitting on a stool, so I can just stay chill. <laughs> but if I gave you just some scriptures to go look at this for yourself, I would give you Genesis 1-2 and Genesis chapter 3, uh, or sorry, 2. Uh, I'll get to it in a second. I'll tell you what verse it is. But let me just give you some background. So when the earth was formless and void, so Genesis 1-1, in 1-2, it talks about how the Spirit of God was hovering over the deep, hovering, hovering over what is formless and void. And so Scripture builds this picture for us about how the Spirit was hovering over the surface, and the word for Spirit there is ra'af which literally means a brooding over or a fluttering over. So anytime through scripture you see the animation of birds or the flooding, fluttering over or the hovering over, it's that same idea of brooding over, preparing to bring into existence what is not yet in existence, okay? Um, if you go on and build the story, we see, of course, verses 3 through 25 that God creates day and night and light and water and ground and seed and vegetation and sun and moon and seasons and animals and people. And if you continue on in chapter 2, you find a critical piece. So here's the verse, verse 7. Verse 7 says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living being. So without the breath of life, without that work of the spirit, the man was formed but was not yet a living being. And man, as we know, was created in God's own image, but with the breath of God inside of us. And if you take that breath illustration and you go further with it, I mean, you can look at Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry, Bo Dry Bones, where Ezekiel sees a vision, and as the bones that are scattered and dry and dismembered come and become formed back into human uh, shape, they are not yet alive until the breath of God breathes into them. So my whole point, without preaching an entire message, is to just say there's a lot of depth there about how much we need the Holy Spirit. We need the breath of God inside of us because we can try as much as we want to muster up inside of us a whole bunch of spiritual feelings or emotions, but without the breath of God, we're missing life. And I'm not trying to create a doctrine of, well, if you wake up tomorrow and you don't feel alive, you're missing this. I, I'm just saying, can we just be people who admit, I need the Holy Spirit in my life? And could we be people who say, Holy Spirit, would you work inside of me? Uh, I met with a young lady yesterday. She's one of the students in our school of ministry at Canyon Creek. And she's She's just coming alive while she's reading the Bible. And she said, it, how, do I, how do I know when God is talking to me? How do I operate in what I feel like he's directing me to do? And I was able to just sit with her and give her some really practical things. I mean, number one, you can say a prayer each and every day. Lord, would you speak to me today by your Holy Spirit? Would you just speak to me and help me to obey you? And then you practice because that's where it gets scary, Right. So the Holy Spirit lays something on your heart and you think, I can't say that. People are going to think I'm crazy. 
And we could all sit around and tell stories about times where we felt like something crazy God had impressed in our heart, and when we acted on it or we shared it or we encouraged somebody, it was exactly what they needed at exactly the right moment. Okay, th that is the Holy Spirit at work inside of us. And you'll probably agree with me, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So as the Holy Spirit is moving in you and through you to speak life into others or to bless them or to be that word of encouragement, you're encouraged having been the vessel or been a part of it. So this, this soul piece of it is really important. It's really a yielding and an obedience to the Holy Spirit. Say, so, we, so far we have these two walls. We have our heart, our, our passion, our longing, our desire to know God and to know him deeply and intimately. And then we have this, this need for the Holy Spirit. It's a soul need. We were created for the breath of God to inhabit us and to use us and not just for us, but to be given away to others. With me so far? Number three is strength. Now, strength comes from the Greek word, I can't pronounce it, esikis or something like that. And it literally means ability, force, or might. In other words, there's a grit and a determination required. And you'll probably agree with me that any form of ministry requires grit and determination. But even just following Jesus, okay, let's say it this way, following Jesus in, in Washington, <laughs> or even in this, in the Pacific Northwest or, the, or this Northwest area of the country requires grit and determination because everything around us is encouraging us against what we believe. And if you're working with kids, you know that kids are getting all kinds of messages, especially if they're in public school, that are often contrary to what we would teach them. And so there's a fight, there's a battle that must happen. Now on a spiritual level, this is a willingness for us to not be quitters. Okay, so spiritually speaking, we can't quit on Jesus, but we also, we shouldn't quit on ministry. Now, I know that there are seasons and there are times to go, and I'm not suggesting you stay someplace for the rest of your life unless the Lord tells you to, but going back to the Holy Spirit part of it, we are to obey the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit tells you, you better dig in your heels and you better not quit and you better keep moving on this, then you better have some grit and determination in you to see that through. Uh, Paul said that we should, um, in order to gain the prize, that we would continually strain or reach for the prize. And that is not a passive word. It's an active word. It requires intentionality and intensity. It requires us prioritizing Jesus as our prize more than anything else, and then backing it up with the willingness to fight even when it really sucks to fight, even when it's really hard, even when you just want to stay in bed because the whole world is against you and you feel like Eeyore under a dark cloud. Even when it's hard, we have to have a determination to fight. I, I by nature, my husband says that I'm the most tenacious person he knows. So if you compare that to like a pit bull that locks its jaws on something and won't let go, to a fault, I often won't let go of things. But I think the blessing of that is it's in my nature to fight when it's hard. And something inside of me rises up and if someone tells me, well, you can't do that, then my immediate reaction is, oh, well, now that you said that, I have to prove that I can. <laughs> and I think we need a little bit of that, at least, in our relationship to the churches we serve and the people that we serve, but also, for sure, in our relationship with Jesus. Because the whole world can come against you, and it could be happening right now, but you have to determine it doesn't matter, I'm not going to quit. Um, Paul also goes on to say, um, when he says, I want to know Christ, um, I just want to reiterate the, the intensity it would require to pursue Christ like literally nothing else even compared. That is an active pursuit of Christ against all odds. And you'll probably agree with me, it's not an easy road. It was never intended to be an easy road. But that intent and purpose takes strength. Now, if I were to take it out of just the spiritual and ministerial realm and make it super, super practical. There are elements of our life that we need to be strong, and one of those is our physical body. So if I could just kind of soapbox it for just a second here. 
Um, you could be the most spiritual person around, a, a spiritual giant, a man or woman of incredible faith. Nothing rattles you. But if you don't have your whole house in order, then your whole house is at risk. Okay, so let's go back to those load-bearing walls. You can have a really strong wall three ways around the house, but if one wall is weak, the integrity of the entire building is compromised because the whole thing can come down if just one wall is not fortified. So this wall is important. There is a spiritual strength required, but I just want to address the fact that your spirit lives in a physical body. And now we all understand that there are health issues and things that we cannot control. And those, those are difficult and things that have to be overcome. But I'm talking of the things you can control. How is your strength side or the physical side of your life? And usually if I ask that question, I see a lot of eyes go down to the ground because there's a lot of like, well, it could be better. Well, I could stop eating McDonald's. Well, I could stop drinking, you know, 40 ounces of soda for breakfast or, you know, and I'm not here to be condemnation. I'm here to say as health, you are as healthy as your weakest wall. And if your weakest wall is your physical body, then that's as strong as you are overall. Again, no condemnation for me. But I, I've, had to, I've had to preach this to myself. So uh, some people just kind of pride themselves in being tough people. And I have that weird bent. So I don't want you to hear this as pridefully because I've had to, my biggest struggle is if I'm sick or something, I, f I feel like I'm failing at life <laughs> because I should never be anything but strong. And so God's had to work on me that he, his grace is sufficient for me, that his strength is enough for my weaknesses. So hear me say that as well. However, I have set goals for myself physically in order to maintain physical strength, understanding that my spirit lives inside of a physical body. And if my physical body is unhealthy, then it's really hard for me to be able to allow the spiritual side of me to operate. So really simply, uh, at this time last year and the year before, I had so overpacked my calendar and so was not taking care of myself that I was incredibly ill both years. So two years ago, for seven weeks, I had pneumonia. That's why we were doing a building remodel, by the way. And last year, for five weeks, I had pneumonia. And both times, I broke ribs from coughing because it's a violent experience. And I vomit. I mean, it's terrible. I can't sleep. And so here I am coming up on the time of the year that two years prior, I've been very ill. It's been the month of October, <clears throat> usually lasts till Christmas or close to it. And here I am speaking and traveling. And so I have had to be extra careful taking care of the physical house that the spirit lives in. Okay, so that's things like I drink a lot of water. Can, can we just be this practical? I drink a ton of water. I, I can't even remember the last time I drank soda. It's just not, and again, no judgment. I'm not judging you if you do. I just know if I drink soda, that's less water than I'm drinking. So I drink a lot of water. I, uh, I prioritize sleep. If you have little kids, that's much more difficult. My kids are older. They don't need me to get up in the middle of the night with them. So I, I prioritize sleep. If I know I have a super busy schedule, I go to bed early. Even if there's laundry to be done, even if there's chores to be done, they might just have to wait. And I prioritize exercise. And I prioritize that big time. So... I have a side business as a personal trainer. For fun, if you want to look up my kind of training, it's a Russian style kettlebell is my certification. It's, it's, it's through an organization called Strong First. It's an incredibly snobby <laughs> certification. In fact, 40% of people who try and certify it in this actually pass. And so in my snobby certification requires tons of work. And so I spend hours training. Now, that has benefit to my spiritual body, but it has just benefit to my, or my physical body, but it has benefit to me spiritually also because it, this is my time. So I go in my garage, I swing these weights, I'll spend on Fridays, normally right now, I'd be spending two, sometimes three hours, I carve that time out to just be in my garage, which, you know, in and of itself is not fun, but I'm lifting weights, or I'm trying something new, or I'm trying to hit a new goal that I'm working on, and I don't answer my phone, and I am left alone. I don't plan anything in that time period. That's my time. Um, I really highly recommend some kind of physical exercise, but if, 
if you are not somebody who enjoys that, even just walking, it might be um, you might have a hobby that you love or whatever it is. You've got to find something that replenishes you physically. Yes? Are there any questions so far before I get too far past this? And while I figure out what order these notes go back in. <laughs> um, I guess I would go back to saying we can't be quitters. And you can't quit on yourself physically either. So if you are in a place where you feel like you are unhealthy in any of these categories, it's your responsibility to address it. Uh, and that's, that includes your physical health as well. Again, if you're fighting a disease or an autoimmune disorder or something, I, I am not suggesting that you are failing and not taking care of yourself. I'm just saying you got to prioritize that. So you'd probably agree with me if you're fighting cancer, hey, I got to press on and, you know, never miss a Sunday as a kid's pastor. Or something. I mean, we, we have to prioritize health. So sometimes we have to take care of things before we are of any good to other people. Yes? Okay, so we have load-bearing wall number one. That's our heart. Number two is soul. Number three is our strength. And number four is our mind. Now, this one is, is simple but hard to fit in. So mind comes from the Greek word dianoia, which literally means understanding, imagination, or thoughts. So pursuing God this way means that we go beyond emotion. It means that we go to our intellect and to our understanding. It requires that we use what God gave us, which is the ability to think and to reason and to understand and to focus and to meditate. And this is where most people have their eyes roll back in their head. Meditate. I mean, I have to be quiet. I have to go on a prayer retreat. I got to be gone for 24 hours. I had a professor. I'm getting my master's degree right now. I had a professor assign us to a prayer retreat, which was supposed to be like eight hours just by yourself, away from any kind of media or technology, being quiet. That's like the worst kind of torture for me. <laughs> but it was so good for me, too, because you realize quickly how short your attention span is in that particular area. So challenging yourself intellectually and growing in your mind hits a, a, a few different categories. So it's things like studying scripture. Um, it's great to go to church and have a pastor or a teacher tell you what the Bible means. It's great to listen to podcasts. Technology is awesome that we can hear people preach from all over the world. It's great to read a book and read what Beth Moore says that the Bible says. But you read the Bible for yourself. Read your Bible. <laughs> I mean, I, sh I shouldn't have to say it, but I have to say it because it's the first thing to go. Our time with the Lord is usually the first thing, especially if you're busy or you got a lot going on. And so you got to read your Bible. Um, if you're struggling, because I'm all about being practical, if you're struggling with reading your Bible, I'm going to give you some help right now. Start with the book of Psalms. Uh, even if you're not a journal journaler, get a notebook or a piece of paper or a journal and start with the book of Psalms. And for each chapter of Psalms, write down the descriptive words for God. Now, there are none in Psalm chapter 1, <laughs> so start with chapter 2. But just write down, he's a tower, he's a fortress, he's a shepherd, he's a, he's a guide. All the words that the authors of Psalms, predominantly David, are inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down, that their experiences or that God himself declares about himself. And maybe for the first time in your life, you're going to get a third of the way through Psalms, and you're going to have a feeling of who God is for who he says he is, not for all the pastors you've ever heard in your life tell you that he is. you got to learn it for yourself. You'll probably agree with me, especially if you have children, but all of you working in children's ministry, when they get it for themselves, it sticks. Same goes for you. When you see it for yourself, when God speaks it to you, when it comes alive in front of your eyes in your Bible, it sticks which means you got to read your Bible. Uh, you got to ingest it. you got to feed yourself. And I would go so far as to say I would add memorizing Scripture. And the cool thing about memorizing Scripture, which is scriptural, to hide the Word of God in your heart, um, it just shows up all over the place. So um, I've memorized a couple books of the Bible, but don't be impressed because I can't quote them anymore. But <laughs> when I was memorizing them, I could quote the whole thing, chapter and verse. Uh, but it's amazing. You memorize Philippians, and it is, I can go back to Philippians, and I can pull stuff out of there that I memorized four, five, six years ago. Um, I can't, it, it's amazing. Like, I'll be 
encouraging someone or I'll have an opportunity to pray with somebody and I'll start saying, well, you know, in Philippians it says, well, and you guys know because two times I've been up here with a microphone and I've quoted from Philippians because I know Philippians. Um, I memorized uh, the book of Haggai, which incidentally is my favorite book of the Bible, and you'd be amazed how God can use a historical narrative book uh, that actually allows you to speak life over other people as well as over yourself. So memorizing scripture is important. Hebrews 4.12 says, God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. If we want God to be alive and active inside of us, reading his word is part of the deal. So reading the word. So we have our four walls. So we have load bearing wall number one, your heart, your passion, your desire, your perseverance of the Lord, your worship of him, your desire to know him intimately and love him. We have soul, which is our understanding that we need the Holy Spirit. And we need to invite him and ask him to operate and move in our life, to speak to us, to give us opportunities, to share uh, the Lord with other people that are spirit-led opportunities. We have the strength side, which is everything from not quitting in your relationship with Lord, but is also your desire to take care of yourself so that you are a good house for the Holy Spirit. And then we have this uh, mental side or the intellectual side of our mind. And this is our desire to understand and meditate on scripture so that it can transform us from the inside out. And I would add to that if I were being super practical, um, you know, it's really good to study lots of things. I mean, study the Bible for sure. But if you are just fascinated by, like one of my sons is just fascinated by astronomy. I don't know where he got that from, but he watches TED Talks and all kinds of random things about astronomy. And then he spouts off all these random things about stars and galaxies that my eyes glaze over. But I love that he is learning and he desires to learn. I have another son who's just super into sports. So he he researches the minutia of play calling in the NFL or, or the formation of a FIFA team in England somewhere. I mean, find something that you're passionate about and study it and know it and, and put your mind to work because an active mind is a healthy mind. So with that being said, I would love if you have any questions, anything practical, anything you're wondering, how can I help?